Because no one is dying anymore, no one believes that HIV AIDS is relevant to their life. And that virus is still today infecting two million people a year. Because people aren't dying, people don't really see the end stage of being infected with that virus. So they think we've cured HIV. Let's talk about what it was like in the early 80s when this disease first presented itself. I think we were all incredibly discouraged because we were so powerless. A puzzling new disease has appeared in the past couple of years that is spreading rapidly among homosexuals. A disease experts are now calling a national epidemic. Victims of the disease say the government has done nothing and has no plan to. Activism at the start of this epidemic was absolutely critical for our progress. They stood up not only for the rights of the patient, they stood up for the rights of the communities that were being infected and affected by HIV AIDS. The activism actually led to an awareness, and then from there, there was scientific advance. One of the real watershed turning point years was 1996 when we developed the triple combination, which started off with the protease inhibitor. We were able to turn HIV from a completely uniformly fatal disease to one in which people can live a normal lifespan. We started working in Africa in 1998. There was nothing but unrelenting despair. Hospitals were saturated. There wasn't one hospital you could go into that didn't have people in the bed with HIV. We had millions of individuals dying in Africa, and I had everything that I needed to change that with the life-saving drugs in Washington. When the disease threatens to triple child mortality and to reduce life expectancy by 20 years in some African countries, it is time to say that AIDS is also a moral crisis. President Clinton started what we called the Life Initiative, and it said the United States cares about HIV AIDS here in the United States, but we also care about the world. The South African epidemic had matured, and large numbers of people were getting sick and dying. In South Africa, that everything was terrible. We were in the middle of denialism, there was no treatment. The President and Minister of Health was challenging, does HIV cause AIDS? My grandfather was able to speak out you know, against the current sitting president and say this is wrong. We have to rise above our differences and combine our efforts to save our people. It was a call to action that first the U.S. Congress had heeded and developed a series of legislation, and then President Bush announced PEPFAR. And to meet a severe and urgent crisis abroad tonight, I propose the emergency plan for AIDS relief a work of mercy beyond all current international efforts to help the people of Africa. President Bush deserves a lot of credit. He saw this as an imperative generated from an ethical need and acted on it. PEFAR took an approach where we worked on prevention, so preventing infections through mother to baby transmission, but also in young women, even at that very beginning. We were gonna save people's lives. We were gonna prevent mothers from giving the infection to their babies. When I was seven months pregnant, I learned that I was HIV and I was shocked, afraid, didn't know if my baby will survive or not. And when they told me that my baby will be HIV negative, I was like, no, they are joking. They can't do that, so, so they told me that I must do my treatment. I was so scared uh, breastfeeding him, knowing that I have HIV, and it was like, oh, I'm infecting my baby. They said, no, his fight is negative. So I'm very thankful because we know that uh, if you have HIV, you're going to die, but when the, the, the science found the medicine, we are very thankful because we are able to be alive now. The fight against this disease has united us across parties and across presidents, and it shows that we can do big things when Republicans and Democrats put their common humanity before politics. So we need to carry that spirit forward.
How critical was President Obama's continued support of PEPFAR? So at the very beginning, President Obama took the program, asked what the program needed, and Secretary Clinton changed the program. Much more focus on women and girls understanding gender-based violence, pushing us to do and address key cultural issues that were putting women at risk. One of the big pieces we highlighted was the DREAMS project. When I first found out that my mother was HIV positive, I was scared. I was really scared because at the time people were dying. My mother is kind of my strength. She is a break away from the crazy world. I do not really know much about HIV except for the things I hear on the streets or the things I learned in school. So I started educating myself about it. I got so passionate about health promotion that I started attending community meetings. I thought maybe I should just start talking about it myself to other people, especially who had not yet been infected. If girls are empowered and mentored and encouraged to stay in school, you know, and at the same time to stay HIV free, they can be able to be unshaken, especially when the boys come in the scene. So I think Dreams is just about that, encouraging girls to dream. The LGBT community around the globe is highly stigmatized, is forced further and further into the shadows. We know that for men who have sex with men, access to health care is really difficult. Just as they, there's stigma and discrimination in the general community, health workers find it quite difficult to understand uh, sexual diversity and sexual practice. They can't get treatment for a sexually transmitted infection. They can't go for HIV testing because they're worried about disclosing to people what's going on. I'm HIV positive, been living with HIV for seven years. It was hard for me to disclose to the people that I was seeing at that time. I think for some people, they're not given that love in, in, in their societies and in, in, in their families. So they, they drink a lot and also practice unsafe sex. When you get rejection because of, of your sexual orientation, you, you sort of learn to live with yourself and love yourself and make peace with yourself and not try to change yourself because of other people. When you're able to be true to yourself about, about your sexuality, you can also be able to be true to yourself about your HIV status. AIDS does not discriminate. We are on their side. We will fight for them. Aman la. Aman la. We returned to Durban 16 years later for the International AIDS Conference. Our hope is this meeting will be the beginning of the end of the epidemic, as an epidemic, just as the last Durban meeting was the beginning of the global response. It was a time of reflection, but also a time to really understand what is left to do. Uh, anyone who thinks that we have the ability now to rest on our laurels is uh, sorely mistaken. How close are we to ending this epidemic, and why is there so much urgency still, in your view? I think the biggest urgency right now is we still have a large number of infections in the United States, and we have a large number of infections globally. Now is not the time to take your foot off the gas pedal. Absolutely not, and that's why we get up every morning ready to go and ready to ensure that we're doing everything we can to end this epidemic. The greatest achievement of PEPFAR is that it has already saved millions of lives. The United States, it's a heroic story. Uh, you are way out in front in the fight against AIDS. To me, this is as heroic as your intervention in the Second World War.
role of PEPFAR in containing the HIV epidemic has been really unbelievable. It's one of the most generous things ever done. It's fantastic. There's been an immense amount of innovation. PEPFAR has been instrumental making sure that uh, we can uh, bring drugs to those people who are dying, who are not having any single hope. Clearly to end the epidemic, we're gonna need a cure, we're gonna need a vaccine. But the fact that we have this wide array of interventions for infected and uninfected individuals can take us to a point where HIV is no longer a public health threat. PEPFAR has put resources to program in a way that has exceeded any other public health effort on the planet or in the history of mankind. We're going to get to an AIDS-free generation because we give young people, young women especially, uh, the tools that they need to lead and to innovate, and we're going to get out of their way and we're going to follow their example. If you leave one person behind, you've left all of us behind. Because all of us are human, all of us are part of that global family, we're all in this together. That means all of us, independent of race, gender, sexual orientation, either we all move forward together or none of us achieve what we wanted. <laughs>